You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. So it begins again. Welcome to the Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode 301, season 8, The Ocho. National security threat, ghost hunting necromancy, mummified monkeys, and spray painting squirrels. Yeah. All right, so anyway, welcome to the Creepy Geeks Podcast. We have a lot of stuff we like to talk about. And just in case you were wondering, there's a couple different ways you can support the podcast if you'd like, if you'd like the podcast. So if you like this podcast, you can subscribe on YouTube, follow on Spotify, review on Apple Podcasts, support us on Patreon, and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Creep Geeks is what you want to look for. So I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And it begins. All right, so this is season eight of show, and we figured we'd kind of put some stuff in here, and it just sort of coincides with around this time of year. For the past, I don't even know, five, six years, ever since I started paying attention to it, it seems like we get the start of animal-related things that start popping up uh, on the internets and news feeds. Yeah. And so I remember in the past, we put things like there's been all sorts of just random weird stuff like frogs found in salads. Right. Yeah. Snakes dropping out of like airline airplane vents, just weird stuff. And, and this episode's gonna showcase some of the ones I've seen recently. So, because I thought they were kind of just uniquely off-putting to want to talk about on this particular podcast, because we broadcast paranormal news and share our strange experiences and weird news yeah. from our underground bunker in the mountains of Western North Carolina. There you go. Uh, also, if you'd like to call and leave us a message, like using the old telephone, you can certainly do that. We have a toll-free number for you. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yes. All right, so anyway, uh, before we get started, not to toot our own horns, but we got an email from Good Pods, which is a, an app that you can use to listen to podcasts. I said, hey, um, you've been raided. <laughs> okay. And I was like, well, all right. Yeah. So here's what comes up with the email, just the email says, congratulations, Creep Geeks, po- uh, Creep Geeks Paranormal and Weird News Podcast has made the following top listener chart on good pods. Cool. Yep. Uh, number two in the top 100 indie Bigfoot monthly chart. Number three in the top 100 Bigfoot monthly chart. Uh, number six in the top indie Bigfoot all-time chart. Mm. Number seven in the top 100 indie philosophy monthly chart. And number eight in the top 100 indie paranormal monthly chart. Oh. So if you're following along, it's two, three, six, and seven. Hmm. And eight. Now what this means, I have no idea. I mean, sometimes you get these if you have a podcast where it's like, whoa, you're whatever number, and you're like, okay, in relation to what? Yeah. You know, so I I don't really know, but... Uh, if you happen to be a person who voted or clicked on something or whatever, make it happen. We very much appreciate it. So, yeah, there's that. Uh, I, I don't know what weight that holds, but we do have uh, lots of patrons that support us and friends that like to listen and click on stuff. And, you know, like every time we do a podcast and put it up, Ike says, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, so if you're listening, Ike, thank you very much. And everybody else, uh, you know, we, we really appreciate it. So, yeah. All right. So there's been a national security threat that oh. happened a while ago. Okay. And it was really cryptic and nobody would really say. It was like, hey, we got a national security threat. And all these important politicians went into meetings and stuff. And they came out and said, we have a national security threat. And we, we don't know, exa- we don't want to say what it is. And we don't exactly know what it is. And so everybody starts thinking about you know, the thing like UFOs, yeah, drones. What is it? So, and this, I wrote this podcast a minute ago, um, and at the time, nobody really knew what it was. Okay. Well, what was it? Well, we still don't really know, but it just coincided with, let's get this bill passed so we can secure the border, but we need to give like $90 million to Ukraine. 
So it sort of coincided with that. Well, we got a big security threat, and we need to get this money, right? Huh. And I think from what I heard, and I don't know if this is true, because honestly, I lost interest in it. Mm-hmm. The threat was sort of alluded to the idea that Russia wants to put nuclear weapon in space. Oh. Like to take out satellites and stuff, like in orbit in space. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And so it was this big thing, or a blip in the news cycle. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't followed up. But, you know, it's like, oh, we have a big security threat, guys, but we're not going to say exactly what it is. Oh, we need money, and the money we need, you know, to fix the, the money, to fix the bill, uh, we're going to give a little bit of that, but we're going to put a ton towards Ukraine and other things. So it's kind of like you can't ever have a bill passed in this country without, oh, you want this? Let's add these things in it too, which aggravates me, right? So, yeah. And the idea that it was UFOs, somebody actually came out and said, you know, this is not UFOs coming to land and all this stuff. So, But they really sort of laid it out there as being this is a is a national security threat and we should take it seriously. Yeah. In the leak. um, if you want to call it a leak, it's like, well, we think that Russia wants to put a, a nuclear weapon in space. You know, for not not to destroy the, the planet or anything, but just to destroy satellites. Yeah. That's pretty critical. I mean, you knock out satellites, you, you take a you take you can take away a country's infrastructure if they're heavily dependent on things like GPS and you know, information and news and whatever, communication satellites, you knock them all out and they have, they have no way to communicate. I don't know. So I'm trying to look at yeah. Um, but I will say this: um, if the Russia, if Russia is saying this is what we want to do, or alluding to, or it's been found out that Russia wants to do, I I know we already have it up there, okay, where we have kinetic weapons or something, where we can take out satellites. And the funny thing is, is that I talked to a dude who used to be in the Air Force, who I guess today would probably want to be in the Space Force. Yeah. Um, he said that there, for every satellite we have up there, there's a shadow that shadows that satellite. Okay. Like a smaller satellite. Yeah. And it was sort of shadowing, shadowing it, and he said, uh, I allude to the fact that, and we do the same. So I don't really know if that's a real credible threat to have a nuclear weapon in space when you already have satellite killer satellites shadowing important satellites. Hmm. And they track those things. Yeah. Now, uh, I I'm, don't know if what he was saying was whatever, but he said that was his job in the Air Force is that he tracked the things in space. So, hmm. yeah, and this was at a Bigfoot conference. So, I mean, you know, you, you get a little weird stories out there. Okay. So, yeah, the cryptic national security threat sparks UFO theory is been updated to maybe a nuclear weapon in space. It's probably something different now, but uh, I don't know. I just wanted to make reference to it. And it was really sort of relevant when I read the podcast last week for us to do it last week. But instead, we went to uh, we went to an emerald mine yes. sort of set up thing. Where we got to play in a creek and get gems. <laughs> yeah. And I tested an Ozark Trails uh, fanny pack thing. Uh-uh. Yeah, I'm tired of carrying stuff. You know what I mean? Got a lot of stuff in my pockets. I keep my hands free. Very, very you know, if I need to fist the cuffs with Bigfoot. Instead of me. Or right. kick a bobcat. Like right. we almost ran over the other night. Yeah. It was crazy. The other thing was weird, gray, and super hairy. And super fast. Yeah, for a bobcat. We're like, what was that? Because I had a weird feeling. We were coming back. Actually, we were coming back from the Emerald Hollow Mine in North Carolina. And we go down the same road uh, to get to where we're at. And it's all windy and dark and stuff. And I I slowed down. And you looked at me and I said, I got a feeling we're going to see animals. Mm -hmm. And we did. Something crazy came running out. And by the time I seen it, you were like, whoa, what was that? And I I was like, I don't know. I didn't hit it, though, because it didn't make the dunk dunk. Yeah. When you smash an animal family into pieces with your big... Vampire. Yeah. But. Which is always sad. I'm not trying to take anything out. But if it comes between us taking a ditch at 55 miles an hour or me running through a family of raccoons, guess what? <sighs> Sorry, raccoons. Yeah. But having said that, we've seen, well, I've seen lots of animals on my way to work or just in my daily driving. I've seen two baby raccoons. Both rained on, both looking miserable. That was the weird thing. It's just like they were both having a bad time. Yeah, they got you kicked know? out of the house. Yeah. Mom's like, get out. You um, got to move. And the reason, uh, you know, we're like bobcat fixated is because I've seen a second bobcat today. 
or I saw one this morning on my way to work. And then, um, oh, we have a herd of deer on my way to work when I pass by this one area. They stand by the road on my way to work. But when I come home... We stand out there smoking cigarettes and yeah, making fun of the people. But yeah, basically, they're just standing there like King of the Hill style, just, mm-hmm, you know? <laughs> but then when it's time to leave and come home, that's when they're like, I'm going to jump in front of that one, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, it, yeah, it's just been a lot of deer and raccoons and just weird stuff just yeah jumping out in front of I was at one time i was riding with dave buddy dave in new mexico and seen this really tall dog mm. i'm like what the hell's wrong with that dog man because it was huge yeah and he's like hey that's a coyote man i'm like i've never seen a coyote look like that he said, yeah they got long legs around here <laughs> yeah and i've seen coyotes here and they don't have the same long legs they don't so it, it does look different. Because so. I, kept, I kept mistaking one of the coyotes out here for maybe a fox. Because yeah. I, like, I asked him, I was like, why are their legs long? He said, I don't know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, like, it's, okay. it's not like our buddy Dave's a biologist. I know, I but mean. it was just funny. He's like, I don't know. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I'm not from there. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like um, and we had a, <laughs> when a guy got bit in the face. Opening his door off yeah. a mailbox or something, a snake yeah. got him and stuff. Yeah. And I, I told uh, Daniel about it, and he was like, well, it's that time of year. And I'm like, no, it's not, man. <laughs> time of year for what, Daniel? Yeah, like, no, it's not, man. <laughs> it's, so one's like, I don't know. And the other one's like, well. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I don't know what the national security threat is, but I did find out that ghost, investing equal, uh, ghost investigation equals necromancy. Uh. It does. Think about it. This is an article from Higgy Pop where it says necromancy and its links to modern ghost hunting. Okay. I mean, think about it. You, you go to do a ghost investigation. What do you do? You want to solicit, inter, solicit interaction. Yeah. So what do you say? If there's any ghosts here or spirits here tonight and you start doing the questions and you start doing all that stuff, well, you do the same thing with necromancy. You're basically trying to interact with spirits of the dead. Okay. So which one sounds scarier, ghost investigation or necromancy? If you say necromancy, you're like, what are you, a Satanist? What are you, you know, what, what's going on? You're in the darker side of things. But if you're just like, I paid 10 bucks to go take a ghost tour and I want to talk to a ghost, mm-hmm. what's the difference? I think I, we need to call it what it is. Because if you think about it, it kind of is necromancy, right? I don't know. See, Spiritualism, I'm, mediumship and all that. I'm, and then calling out the spirits. Okay. I'm used to just necromancy or the term necromancer meaning raising them from the dead or bringing them forth to harness their power i don't know maybe that's a definition i'm fixated it might be the like books and movies you know um type thing you know where i'm yeah that's kind of what i thought too until i read this stupid article but and more like sorcery whereas like ghost hunting in my opinion is more of like could be construed as divination, like talking with the dead. Okay, know? so they, they put a little thing in here, right? Yeah. A little, little paragraph, if you will. This is one of the best-known forms of necromancy involves ritualistic ceremonies designed to summon the spirits of the dead. These rituals could include the use of incantations, prayers, magic circles, and specific offerings or sacrifices to attract and compel spirits to appear and communicate. In some traditions, uh, sacrifices, whether symbolic or actual, were believed to be necessary to summon a spirit. And though rare, this could involve the offering of animals and and other darker interpretations of of necromancy, like human, right? Okay, so right there, that kind of helps me, because like what I'm trying to say is, for me, I'm used to necromancy meaning like compulsion. Yeah, no, I get it. Compelling the spirit, forcing it to do something. So... To offset that, in modern times, the traditional practice of necromancy, as it's known as it was known in ancient and medieval contexts, is rare. Yeah. However, the fundamental desire to communicate with the dead persists in various forms. Modern spiritualization, for example, can be seen as a coordination of necrom- and necrom- how do you say it? necromantic practices, mediumship, seances, and the use of technology to communicate with spirits. All reflect the endearing. <laughs> human curiosity about the afterlife. In other words, just because the method changes doesn't mean it's not the same thing. But, I don't know. Necromancy means, to me at least, the successful compulsion of the dead person or dead spirit 
to do whatever your bidding is. Whereas ghost hunting, how much of ghost hunting is actually truly successful? How much of necromancy is truly successful? Uh, if the intent is to communicate, we have mostly okay, anecdotal so texts. If you're sitting so. there and you're trying to compel a spirit to make an interaction happen, like make my K2 lights blink or set off my REM pod, yeah. which is really a theremin. If you guys want to get a REM pod, just buy a theremin. Yeah. Although the price difference is probably negligible, but you're trying to compel or, you know, make the ghost communicate. Same thing with necromancy. You're trying to com- basically have interaction, communication, right? Okay. So paranormal investigation also shares similarities with necromancy. While these activities do not typically involve ritualistic elements or the explicit intention of summoning spirits for divination or guidance, they represent a contemporary form of engaging with the spirit world. Hmm. I, I don't, I don't, it, it's all, it's a long leap for me. Not for me. If you nuts and bolts it. The methods, methods may be different, but it's kind of the same thing. Now, it depends on how you look at it, right? It, all this stuff really does. I mean, mm-hmm. it, if you take necromancy to the black magic TV movies, you know, of what you're trying to do kind of thing, then, yeah, ghost hunters aren't really doing that. They're just trying to, hey, can you tell me something about yourself? Can you is it cold speech? where you are? Yeah. Whereas necromancy on TV is like, I need you to do whatever. Well, not even TV. I mean, like. I'm just like, using because everybody sees it like with, you know, different horror shows and things like that but okay more dramatic stuff but at the end of the day it's still the same thing you're trying to divine or have some sort of divination or communication with spirits of the dead and however you compel that to happen whether it's through request or whatever just i don't think the rituals necessarily matter i mean one should i would think that the dirtier the deed the darker the magic right but i mean who knows You're saying the divination is the necromancy. I'm saying necromancy is a an art unto itself with the goal of compelling a spirit to do something. Okay. So what if you're doing necromancy and you want the spirit just to communicate? I don't know. I, I'm I, a ghost hunter and I just want the spirit to communicate. What's the difference? I would say that's some form of divination. Like, I don't know. I think it's like subsecting things to me. I so. think it's basically like, you know, are you, I'm going to use this as an example, might make people, are you a garbage man or a sanitation engineer? <laughs> you know, and really, if it was me personally, whichever one's paying more is which one you can call me, right? Okay. If sanitation engineer paid me 65 bucks an hour, that's what I am. But if a garbage man pays 70 bucks an hour, I'm a garbage man, dude. But see, in that case, necromancy, which results in a successful compelling of a spirit or raising of a spirit to do your bidding most bang for your buck. Whereas ghost hunting, it's like, we're just going to talk to them if we can. And a lot of times they can't. A lot, a lot of ghost investigations are not successful. I think a lot of necromancy is not successful. Yeah. Unfortunately, the only proof we have is like anecdotal writings. So, you know. From, well, yeah, but you can write anything. Right. From way back when, you know. Yeah. Tomato, potato. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's much the same. So there you go, you necromancers. Out there doing your necromancy. So. Paying your $10 or whatever to go on a ghost investigation. Watch within six months. Popular paranormal teams are just going to just switch themselves and start calling them all necromancers. No, because that makes it, it gives you the evil connotation and people don't want to be involved with that sort of thing. They, you know, about the most extreme scary thing you can see with most ghost investigations is their freaking t-shirts. They're all black. <laughs> right? Or the amount of gel Extreme. They use. <laughs> I'm an extreme investigator. I have my black T-shirt with glow-in-the-dark lettering. Yeah. Right? And I may be wearing black pants. It's like everybody that's in this whole ghost investigation thing, I, I, it probably came from um, Zach Baggins and coming in from L.A., right? Because yeah. around the time they popped up, and you got like Chris Angel and those other extreme magicians yeah. doing the same thing. They put on my extreme shirt. Get out there and investigate stuff. Because you know you're not a real ghost investigator. If you're not wearing a black T-shirt. Mm. And me, I'm a little different. I like to wear a navy blue T-shirt. Like this one says Mothman on it. Right here, you see this one? <laughs> yes. So, it's very nice. All right. So anyway, speaking of mummified monkeys. Oh, that's a great yeah, segue. <clears throat> it is. It's an excellent segue because this dog, this CBD, CBP, I guess that's Customs Border Protection Dog. 
canine. Slips, it basically sniffed out some illegal import of mummified monkey remains. First off, I've that's interesting, mummified monkey remains. Secondly, they put a picture of, uh, oh. his name is Buddy. Yeah. He's got two Ds and an EY, so it's B-U-D-D-E-Y, right? So, Customs, uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection intercepted an individual attempting to illegally import four deceased and dehydrated monkeys into the United States via Logan Airport. Mm. Mm. Yep. The individual was returning to the U.S. after a recent visit from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Oh. What was that movie called? Uh, Outbreak? With Dustin Hoffman running around being a... Yeah. Um, I don't know what he was, but basically it was The Plague and Patient Zero and all that stuff. It was a pretty good movie. But, uh, but when questioned about the bag, a passenger declared that it only held dried fish. Okay. Like, hey, is this a dehydrated, mummified monkey? He's like, no, it's fish. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, but the luggage was x-rayed and it appeared to hold dried fish. Still, upon physical inspection, the officer identified the dead and dehydrated bodies of four monkeys. Ew. Yeah. So raw or minimally processed meat from wild animals in some areas of the world, including Africa, is referred to as bush meat. Yuck. Yep. We call that uh, jerky. <laughs> Get some beef jerky, right? Yeah. Uh, bush meat comes from a variety of wild animals, including bats, non-human primates, non-human primates like monkeys, cane rats, oh. uh, antelope, and some other stuff. And it may pose a communicable disease risk. And these types of meat are these types of meat are not allowed entry into the U.S. because it's gross. <laughs> because it's gross. Yeah. It's gross. <laughs> now, what you got there? You got some bush meat? Yes. What is this? It's monkey. Get out. <laughs> Right. It's gross. I'm going to need you to put this in the trash can. First, <laughs> ooh, that's gross. And secondly, who brings bush meat? You, go, you can get bush meat at any 7-Eleven, <laughs> right? any grocery store, any gas station. Got plenty of bush meat. Ours is just typically made from cows and ostrich and chicken and turkey and whatever else you can make jerky out of. So uh, the court... Uh, basically, the Border Patrol people, Customs and Border Patrol, immediately contacted the Center for Disease Control and the CDC requested that the luggage containing the bush meat be seized and that Delta Airlines either destroy or return the bags to France. Oh, I would destroy the bags too, honestly. Yeah, I'd blow the whole thing up, put it in a hole in the ground. <laughs> well, there are some places in Europe that if you leave your baggage or you know luggage unattended, they will just take it out and put it in a big giant hole. Yeah. Like at the end of the runway somewhere with everybody else's stuff that's been left unattended and blow the whole thing up or set it all on fire. Yeah. So you don't want to, you know, leave your stuff. You don't. You definitely don't want to leave your bush meat unattended if you're doing that. So the four kilograms of bush meat was detained uh, by the CDC and marked for destruction. And the potential dangers caused by uh, bringing bush meat in the U.S. is is basically are real. And this came from uh, Julio Caravia, Cavera- Car- who's basically a board director of a CDP in Boston. Bush meat can carry germs that can cause illness, including the Ebola virus, which is a work, uh, you know, which is uh, terrible. That's just, I think that's what it was in the movie, uh, Outbreak, with Dustin Hoffman was Ebola, I'm not sure. Uh, but the work of CBD's K-9 unit and agricultural specialists were vital in pre- uh, basically preventing the potential danger from entering the U.S. And the dog's name was Buddy. Yeah, kind of crazy, right? Yeah, so the movie Outbreak, it was about a fictional Ebola-like virus and orthomyroxaviridae virus in Zaire. So, Zaire, Africa. So, crazy virus from Africa. Yeah. Here we go. Crazy virus possibility from bushmeat from Africa. Necromancy, ghost investigation. Stop it. (laughs) See what I'm doing here? All right. No. Ah, clever. Moving into the next segment uh, of the podcast. We're going to talk about spray painting squirrels. Oh, gosh. It's awful. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I could, let me see if I can play some kind of something that you can take a break, like a commercial type thing. We don't really have a commercial because, well, we just don't. We support our own little, little podcast uh, with help from patrons and friends and stuff like that. So we're going to play this and we're going to take a, take a second, play this little commercial. We'll be right back. Are you looking to start a podcast? Then see this episode's show notes for our unique promo code to get up to two months of free podcasting service with Libsyn when you sign up for a new account. 
Get your show on Apple and Spotify. Get helpful audience building stats and all the support you need to sound your best. They can even do video. Bring your podcast to life and have your voice heard here, there, and everywhere with Libsyn. Again, see our show notes for our unique Libsyn promo code and get podcasting. Yeah, you can do that. Have your own podcast. Do you, uh, you can make it wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservationist Post from NYS. New York State, yeah. Yes, basically put this little thing in here, and it takes you to a link to Facebook. Yeah. So a squirrel painter... Was recently, Let that sink in, guys. Yeah, a squirrel painter. Squirrel painter. Kids, what do squirrels you Squirrels are pretty when you freaking fast, right? <laughs> <laughs> this squirrel painter. Yeah. But a squirrel painter was recently caught red handed, haha, in Putnam County. On January 13th, environmental conservation police officers assisted in charging a Putnam County man for a series of squirrel painting incidents in the town of Patterson. So I guess this all started on December 23rd. <clears throat> where officers Franz and Shuck met with Putnam County Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, detectives, and a probation officer regarding an individual on probation suspected of painting squirrels red and then releasing them in a nearby town park. That's awful, y'all. I think that's brilliant. Why? Because these these squirrels Mm -hmm. are doing something. And he wants to track the bad guy squirrels. So he's not blanketly saying all squirrels are bad. He's like, I would like you to be able to identify the bad squirrels, the squirrels he's interested in. So in order not to, you know, blanket all the squirrels, just the ones he's worried about. On December 28th, these environmental conservation police officers conducted surveillance in the area and observed a bright red squirrel crossing the street less than a block away from the subject's residence. So they interviewed the subject on January 13th. He admitted to trapping squirrels and painting them in order to keep track of those returning to his yard and causing his dogs to bark. Yes. So the ECO officer, Franz, ticketed the subject for violations relating to the trapping, transporting, and liberating of wildlife. Now, Putnam County SPCA detectives also charged him for the mistreatment of animals. And if you look at the photos in this link, this dude is looking, looks like he's using Rust-Oleum 2X Red Ultra Accent. So he's using good paint. He's using quality. He's not spraying them with some dollar store crap. He's using good quality paint. Yes, good quality makes it even worse for these animals. Did you know there is, there is dog safe temporary dye and spray? You should be asking yourself why. Is their dog safe? Temporary dye and spray. I can answer that. It's for Halloween. So, like, we could turn Pepper into a skunk or, like, a poodle. You can make it look like a My Little Pony, which is cool. But it's it's animal safe. So, it's not... So, would you be okay... It's not Rust-Oleum Ultra you, Accent. Would you be okay with, you know, basically spray painting these squirrels if it was animal safe? Not this is by, a slippery slope. Not by an everyday <laughs> Joe. Now, so if it was, if it if was a trained inv- professional, environmental conversation conservation officer or professional dog groomer, maybe. Okay. Even though, I'm, so this guy is tracking the squirrels that are coming into his yard and making his dogs be stupid. Which is dumb. Well, guess what? There are uh, we we used to have a really well behaved dog yes. until a squirrel came on the scene, and then he would lose his mind. <laughs> I made a video one time of getting some faux fur that you could buy from a craft store and wrapping it around some foam for basically a wind cat for uh, yeah. a wind muff for a microphone. Yeah. So when you go outside, you don't hear, you know? Yeah. And he tried to, he did not care at all that I was holding on to it. He fixated on it and tried to climb me to get that squirrel. <laughs> all, I mean, he had no, he even got a little, he had no hunting dog tendencies or anything like that. Squirrel. Yeah. He wanted it. He even got the little ridge of fur up his back. Yep, and that, yeah. that was his job. I guess that was what he was supposed to do, was be a squirrel hunter, retriever yeah. dog, or whatever, and, and he did not care at all. So I can see where this guy was getting worried. 
and freaked out because this dog's probably just would not shut up for hours because these squirrels that taunt, because you've seen squirrels sitting in trees, you know, flicking their tail, taunting animals. Yeah. Yeah. But the, this is kind of. This is no different than in like uh, Norway or whatever when they spray paint the reindeer antlers with the glow in the dark paint. And that paint has been approved. The Rustoleum Ultra Accent has not been approved for squirrel usage. Well, maybe it should be. Maybe this guy should basically send in a letter to Rustoleum <laughs> saying, hey, so I've been spray painting squirrels and got a ticket. <laughs> right? So I thought it was pretty funny. And I'm like, I get why he's doing it in his mind. It makes complete sense. I, I just. You make me want to work in their customer service department. Yeah, because I would put that on the wall somewhere. Imagine right? the email. So I Imagine spray painted the a tortoise. So, yeah. <laughs> so. And, you know. so he's tracking the squirrels. This is. Horrible. I mean, he could have easily, because he has a trap. He could have they just. Got, they got in the trap and he sprays them. Why didn't he just keep them in the trap and take them like 75 uh, miles away to the farm? Let them go. Don't spray paint squirrels. Just don't. I don't think you should be telling me what to do. <laughs> you. Yeah. You specifically. If we lived if we lived in the middle of nowhere and a squirrel kept doing something or a raccoon or whatever, and we spray painted him and he kept coming back, we'd know that's the one we got to take away. That's what the trap is Makes for. Makes sense. That's what the trap is for. Can't take them all away. What if you take away a raccoon or whatever that has family members? And then you see him in the yard as you're going back and, to, back and forth to work, all looking all wet and rained on. <laughs> Where did my family go? Because trap them all, and you call a rehab. Like can't, a, you can't track like them all. Wild life and what are they going to do? They're going to put f- them in rehab for a while and say, "Okay, you're rehabilitated. Let them go. To go. <laughs> They're back on the streets." We're talking about animals. Back on the streets. They're not going to release them onto the streets. You know, doing public nasty business and on the sidewalk, doing and crimes, stuff. <laughs> eating trash, and doing crimes. I think he look. This guy is a hero. <laughs> He started something. He's like, hey, got a problem with problem squirrels? And he did a whole... Not all squirrels are bad guys, but these red ones, these little bastards are bad ones. Right <laughs> it's here. not even a good paint job. The squirrel is only half painted. How much does he need to be painted? And he's pink. <laughs> well, that's why he, he probably... Listen, if, listen. He has probably done this enough <laughs> to where he had to keep stepping up and buying better paint because he figured out that it was fading over time. This guy's probably been doing this for a long time. And he just, you know, finally got a good enough paint that didn't fade or whatever. And people, somebody's seen this bright red squirrel run across the road. There's more to this. I don't oh, want to talk I'm to sure. this guy. He probably doesn't want to talk. He's like, look, man, these damn squirrels. Yes. No, there's dog safe spray that you can use on dogs and cats. I'm pretty sure you can use it on squirrels. This is cruel. I honestly don't think the squ- squirrel gives a single crap. Have you seen squirrels? Yes. They they don't care. You know, when we try to feed them, we come up the driveway, and they will sit until they are like right underneath your tire and then try to run away. Some of them are not smart. Just because they're not smart does not mean they don't deserve <laughs> to be treated okay. It would be good to identify the dumb ones because, you know, okay, that's a dumb squirrel. He's going to wait for me to run him over before he tries to move. Use your Harbor Freight coupon and just buy more traps and then relocate them. Where? You can Somebody act- else's lawn? Somebody else's? <laughs> Where are you going to take them? You can just actually keep releasing call, them. <laughs> you can call your local wildlife rehabber. Because, like, we actually have different ones here where we live in Western North Carolina. I like how you're arguing with me like I'm going to do any of this stuff. <laughs> I know. Like you're trying to educate me. <laughs> so that somebody else listening to the podcast right now is like, I am totally doing what he said. And you're, you're just trying to save somebody the aggravation of having to explain to their wife <laughs> <laughs> why there's red squirrels running around. I'm giving their wife ammo to be like, why didn't you call a wildlife rescue? Do you think with being crafty and stuff, that I'm sure there's a lot of people have done that. Like our neighbors that one time where she was catching the squirrels because they had squirrels that was kept eating the bird bird seed out of the bird feeder. Yeah. And they had like cardinals and all that stuff. And she caught them and I was like, what are you going to do with that? She's like, well, you know, we catch them because they eat birds, bird seed in the bird feeder. And I said, you're going to eat it? And she got super mad and wouldn't talk to me <laughs> for like months. Mm-hmm. It was innocent because we have family members that you go squirrel hunting and you don't just shoot them just to shoot them. What are you shooting them for? You shoot them to eat them. 
so it was an honest question. We were in Virginia, not that far from the South, depending on how, who, who you ask, we're in the South or not in Virginia. Yeah. And these were big old healthy city squirrels, <laughs> you know, fattened up on pizza and stuff, you know? Okay. Yep. It's wrong. Okay. So there you go. Omi says if you use dog safe paint, you can spray paint any wall. Like <laughs> I'm not you want. saying you can. I'm saying there are other options. She's like, options. it's better. It's more. If, if, if you think of that guy was like, look, man, this is dog safe paint. You're like, oh, man. Okay. That's cool. There are other It's only options. okay for the city to spray paint animals. <laughs> not if we had a pet deer, I'd spray paint them too. You know why? So, because if you've seen a, a red deer or a spray painted deer running around, would you shoot it? You'd probably be like, I bet that's somebody's pet. Yeah. But I would use dog safe paint. And that would last one rain. Okay. And then you know what happened? Have you seen Bambi? <laughs> I haven't seen Bambi in four weeks. He's not eating the food. Stop it. And I'd be like, did you use the Rust-Oleum paint? And you'd be like, well, no, I use this. I'm like, well, okay, there you go. Worn off, somebody shot it. Stop it. That's exactly what would happen. I'd make that thing as fluorescent as possible. Because oh, you know what? Deer don't care. They do. No, they don't. They wait and like, run. And they, they, no, they don't care. It ain't like a chicken where if you put a dot on top of a chicken's head, the other chickens will peck him to death because he's different. It's not like that. Deer would show off. <laughs> like, look at me, guys. You wish you were this, uh, look at my drip. <laughs> Stop it. So. All right, so anyway, uh, there you go. That's, uh, that's good to know about uh, mummified monkeys and spray-painted squirrels. Well, this gets into uh, something that we're going to talk about that I think um, we've talked about many times in the past, and it's the idea mm. of taking selfies with wildlife. Mm. Yeah. Now, this article says that wildlife selfies harm wildlife. Okay. And so the wildlife selfies harm wildlife. This is off a website called the conversation.com. I don't know what the deal is with it. Yeah. But it kind of leads the premise to where it says one of the biggest privileges of being a, a primatologist, right? And this is sort of leading into why you shouldn't do this. Yeah. Is spending time in remote locations with monkeys and apes and living near these animals and their habitats and experiencing their daily lives, right? So it's a, yeah, I, I guess that'd be, it's a privilege, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as a 21st century human, I have an, an immediate impulse to take pictures of these encounters and share them on social media. Yeah. Yeah. And social media can help science, scientists basically raise awareness of species that, that get studied and promote their conservation, obtain jobs, research funding, all that sort of thing. However, sharing images of wild animals online can also contribute to illegal animal trafficking and harmful human wildlife interactions. Yeah. I'm thinking of Yellowstone where somebody tries to get him to take a selfie with a buffalo and then it's freaking shock when the thing is eating them 25 feet in the air. Yeah. You know, or running into your car or whatever, because it can basically put them at further risk. So saying that taking selfies can put the animals at risk. Um, so the research that needs to happen is is sort of occurring, but this one person did the research where it says, my research seeks to find ways for scientists and conservationists to harness the power of social media while avoiding its pitfalls. Hmm. And they think they may have some answers. Okay. And it says, you know, we need to have our answers. In our view, wildlife professionals should never include themselves in pictures with animals. All right? Yeah. And they also believe that featuring infant animals and animals interacting with humans leads viewers to think about these creatures in ways that are counterproductive to conservation. Oh. Well, it's a cute bobcat. Let's take it home and feed it, and it becomes a cat on TikTok. Yeah. Right? Okay. Um, many conservation biologists are thinking hard about what role the social media can take and what should play in their actual work. Uh, for example, the International Union for Conservation of Nature's section on human primate interactions has issued guidelines on how to use images of wild primates and how to conduct primate watching tours. So they're trying to basically make this better. And the guidelines recommend that when scientists show photos of themselves and with a wildlife primate, uh, the caption should state that the person in the image is a trained researcher or conservationist and, uh, and make sure that they put like a little, dis- basically a disclaimer, right? Yeah. And there isn't much data assessing whether that approach is going to be effective. Look, there's nothing you could say or do. Yeah. And then try to track it on social media to see if it's effective or not. 
But they are saying that even with those, you know, with the warning captions, it's still not as it's still not effective because even with those, uh, they they showed a group of over three thousand adults these mock Instagram posts and then asked them to complete a survey. And I guess regardless of the caption, more than half of the viewers agreed or strongly agreed that they would want to seek out a similar experience with a loris or a gorilla. Over half of the viewers agreed or strongly agreed that they would want these animals as pets and that the animals would make good pets. Uh, Here's where I just need to interact and say no shit. Yeah. You show pictures on the internet. You're sitting there on your couch and you're scrolling and you see a picture of a bobcat. And you're like, ooh, I'd like to have a bobcat. And you get a question that pops up. Of course you're going to say yes. Yeah. And they, I think they take the idea of that when people see something on the internet, they're immediately going to do that. And that's not the case. Yeah, you know how many times I've clicked on dinosaurs and stuff? So yeah, I'd like to have a dinosaur. Do you think I really want a freaking dinosaur? But. I, Scrolling on the internet yeah. is completely different than interacting in real life. For a majority of people, yes. However, and I can use an example from my own life and my own job right now. I currently follow um, NC Wildlife Resources Commission, NCWRC, right? And they regularly post, y'all stop asking us about pet raccoons. You can't have them in North Carolina. Oh, you can. (laughs) And people do. And they regularly post, you know, wildlife safety tips. And people hop in there and they're like, you don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to I have mean, a think good about time it. with my friends. How did people have pet yeah. raccoons and, and groundhogs and all stuff in the past? Something happens, you get a little baby, and you you raised it. Yeah. And the same thing And goes, the people that are asking these questions, like, can you have a pet raccoon? They're like, can I go down to the store and buy a, a baby raccoon? Yeah. Now, despite these pro programs where, like, stop messing with raccoons, stop messing with possums, if you go on TikTok right now, like... An overwhelming amount of people have a raccoon, a fox, or a possum as a pet. There's like two people I follow on TikTok that have coyotes as pets. Sure. You know? And regardless of what the caption says, I'm like, look, they've domesticated that coyote. That makes it okay for me. I know that's not true. Well, I know, but the survey is not giving you that ability. They're saying that you're you're going to do this. And you post a cute baby animal Instagram post and you ask two stupid questions like, would, would you like to have this? Pet? Of course I would. It's soft and furry and cuddly. Yeah. You think these people are really, really serious? Yeah. Like, I am going to get, as my mission, a baby soft and fuzzy raccoon. And see. No. No. But this person, this writer's solution, like putting these more jarring social media posts out here like they have this picture of a woman taking a cute pic between two i don't know what those are are those chimps um two large primates and then it has this big orange caption don't be fooled this is cruelty so oh orangutans it's orangutans um sure that's a jarring message set against a cute picture this person is not taking into account the algorithm the algorithm is going to pick up on that negative statement in that large caption, and it's going to move that photo further down and yeah. keep pushing up those cute primate and raccoon photos and videos. Right, and here's why I put this in here, yeah. right? Because I knew you were going to say that, yeah. right? Because what I'm thought is, if it's cute and fuzzy, everybody's going to see it. And you're going to people just on the drive-by, ooh, yeah, yeah. and they're going to keep on scrolling, <laughs> and they're not going to remember that animal at all. Yeah. Which the survey doesn't take into account. Yeah. But the survey says, while these responses may sound merely sentimental or naive, research shows that media, particularly social media, contribute to harmful human interactions with wildlife and to the exotic pet trade. But It's It's like you don't even get it. You you, you post this and you're trying to say, well, these people are trying to be, you know, they're naive. It's like you don't understand how social media works. If you posted, hey, if you could have a a pet baby son that can eat black holes... (laughs) Right, or black holes that could eat sun, and you could have it as a pet, would you? And they're like, hell yeah, I would. Yeah. In real life, would you really want that? No, because it you know, it inverts gravity, and you're going to be lost in the gravity well and everything else. And so it's like we're going to use a post and put it on social media to use social media as a reason to say why it harms and stuff, not knowing that the entire point of social media 
when it comes to those particular groups who would just post or to get interaction. And you're not going to get a true, honest, visceral, authentic reaction from people that will take the time to answer your thing. Because <laughs> they could have put a little block yeah. in there that says, you know, do you want this animal? Do you think this animal is cute? And would you like to have one? And then it says, seriously, would you really want one of these as a pet? Yeah. And somebody would be like, no, because it shits all in the house. It bites you. You know, whatever, because they know, because they're smart. Right there, what you just suggested them doing would actually improve their chances because that right, but post they didn't do it. Enfor- that post forces engagement. So this, and the method in which they're going about this is not going to get in that, that engagement at all. Right. What they're trying to yeah. do is prove their own thesis or theory on the premise that people are dumb as shit already. <laughs> And that they're going to they're gonna craft the results based off of this. Instead of saying, I wonder if, and then doing a scientific research, they're saying that we think that people that interact with animals because of social media, are, this is the bad. Yeah. So we're going to make it happen. <clears throat> Instead of saying, let's do an actual experiment and yeah. do double blind and all this other stuff and say, at the end of the day, we can't say that this is bad or not. They really want to push their narrative. You know why? It's funding and everything else. Yeah. So it's like, oh, so the internet people are stupid, but you're you're putting it in a way to make the internet people stupid. Yeah, I mean, and because yeah, I like people with chimpanzees, like, oh, I love chimpanzees until they rip your arms, hands, and groin off and chew your face off. Yeah, and and which it, they will do. It's not just like this animal stuff. So back during 2020, 2021, we had in North Carolina and actually a big part of the Blue Ridge Mountains, we had some climbing accidents. Unfortunately, some of them were actually captured on video, and they were very tragic, and they were very gruesome. Um, Now, most of that footage was not available on social media, but some of it was. The problem was, as soon as these things happened, different agencies and organizations went out to do, you know, climbing safety practices and climbing safety videos and climbing safety photos and warnings, and all of those went nowhere because they weren't engaging. They didn't show, you know, or or provide the user a moment to engage in the content in a way that you could watching, like, a horrible climbing accident. Yeah. So all of that was for nothing, and it actually took a couple of documentaries posting on social media, clips of their documentary, to actually get engagement and to realize, oh, climbing in the Blue Ridge Mountains is dangerous. Yeah. So, and it that took over a year of algorithms, yeah, we get marketing. Yeah, because people that put know. these, they, they don't understand how social media works. Yeah. And they're shocked when they don't get the results that they want. <laughs> it's just like companies or even like municipal government organizations don't get that you can't just post one thing and all of a sudden everybody in the world is going to know your social media. Yeah. And that's not how it works. And I'll tell anybody that. <laughs> it's like the governor's like, I don't understand. It's like, of course you don't understand. Yeah. Social media is a real thing. Yeah. And you have to cultivate it, and you have to grow it, and you have to be authentic, and you have to do things that make people want to watch and see what you do. It takes time. You're not just going to blow up like Mr. Beast and have the biggest like municipal website in the world or you know a presence in the world about your little local town. It does not work that way, not a bit. This dude cultivated by doing years and years of videos, spending millions and millions and millions of dollars, and he got the result. They think, oh, I, I can, you know, well, it's been six months, and it's like... A, it takes longer than that to actually build a real presence. Six months, and you have 250 views on your yeah. video. It's like, oh, so. well, uh, you should give me more. It's like, uh, I mean, come on. Yeah. It's, un- it's, it's an unrealistic <clears throat> expectation that a lot of places have when it comes to social media. People cultivate that stuff over years. Mm-hmm. And they can tell you all the steps it takes to do it, and you can try to implement it. But if you don't cultivate it yourself, it's not going to do anything. No. And if you don't follow up with, and follow up with the way things are because it changes – it's just going to die on the vine. Like, you know, if, if you post videos and stuff that aren't trending, nobody sees it. So if they didn't in this survey and this research that they did, if they didn't make a post engaging, they would get no engagement and they couldn't say that social media harmed animals by taking selfies with them or not. Yeah. And even in the idea of just taking a selfie and harming animal, they put that in there deliberately to get your attention. They make it clickbaity. Yeah. Right. Wildlife selfies harm animals. Oh, I'm clicking. I yeah. sure as hell click on it. Oh, but wait. Isn't like, there, how does it harm it? Aren't there new algorithms and metrics in place to avoid clickbaity stuff? 
Yes. Yeah. So you're I still double click on doing it. yourself wrong. It's like wildlife <laughs> selfies harm animals. Well, how? If I take your picture, does it shock them? Yeah. Does it shoot them? You know, no, it doesn't do any of that stuff. It's like you, you harm the environment by being there. You harm the environment by the fact that the animal gets used to humans and all these tertiary things that occur, you know, which can occur anyway. I mean, the animal doesn't know his internet's on, his, he doesn't have an internet presence. So they're saying that basically overall, okay, if it, if people see enough interactions with people on the internet doing selfies and stuff, eventually it'll become more and more okay. And it happens and then it can cause problems. Sure. And then all it takes, though, is for that one buffalo, right, that great big bison to yeet somebody 25 feet in the air, and a lot of people start thinking about it. Yeah. Well, maybe I don't want to interact with that because, you know, just as many people are watching this occur from 50, 75 feet of safe, respectful distance away, there's one or two nutbags that are, like, right up close trying to capture shots. So that's where I, I respect National Park Service. They did a post recently. I believe it was National Park Service, and it was like, what is a good safe distance to take photos of wildlife from? And they had the park ranger hold up their thumb and they're basically like, can you still see the animal, you know, past your thumb? And then they did like some mock scenarios. Yeah. And it kept saying not safe, not safe. Then finally, when you couldn't see something like a buffalo or a, or a black bear behind the thumb, that was the best distance you could be to take a photo, but also go ahead and stand a few more feet back. Yeah, you know. that's garbage. <clears throat> I know. You're like, oh, if it's the size of a nickel, you're safe. Get yeah. out of here, man. Well, considering bears can run some crazy, how fast? Like 35 bear? miles an hour or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I get it. But, you know, if you're going to if you're gonna take a picture of an animal. Bears run 35 to 40 miles per hour. What did I just say? Yeah. Wow. You know what? I was going to press the button and say <laughs> Foo Fighters, but I'm on the wrong screen. <laughs> they wouldn't do it, but. Yeah. And, you know. Uh, and, and to be fair, we have been incredibly too close on several occasions to wildlife. I know. Thinking that our calm, cool energy is going to protect us. Let's see. Oh. I, I'm looking really at you <laughs> because I gave myself a little bit of a head start because I can't run. I, I got issues. I just want to be a little further back so that as you passed me in 100 miles an hour, I can say, save yourself. So let's see. What have I been? Don't, don't. Yeah. We're not doing that. So anyway, moving back into the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Uh, I think we're done. I yeah. think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So just in case you uh, forgot, at the very beginning of this podcast, 53 minutes ago, according to Good Pods, we were number two in the top 100 indie Bigfoot monthly chart, number three in the top 100 Bigfoot monthly chart, number six in the top 100 indie Bigfoot of all time chart, and number seven in the top 100 indie philosophy monthly chart, and number eight in the top 100 indie paranormal monthly chart. You know what that means? What? My generic search engine optimization keywords, tags, and phrasing is working. Oh, okay. Because what do we talk about? Weird news. Yeah. Ghosty stuff. Bigfoot stuff. Cryptid stuff. Yeah. Yay. Okay. So there you go. (laughs) (laughs) That's how we do it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Again, if you want to reach out to the podcast, uh, contact at creepgeeks.com or... Hit us up on social media, please. We're looking for more folks to join our Facebook group. That's where we have most interactions. But you can also find us on TikTok, uh, Instagram. We have a Facebook page. We're pretty much all over. So find us, interact, reach out. Right? That is correct. Yeah. We look forward to it. So anyway, there you go. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, let us know. We do appreciate you taking time listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. This is episode 301, season 8, The Ocho. National security threat, ghost hunting, necromancy, mummified monkeys, and spray painting squirrels. There you go. All right. See you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.